Let of my mouth the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. I have seen the Lord. Those are words of great faith, words of great, great affirmation from the lips of Mary Magdalene. This morning we come today, the third day, third day that began on that Thursday as Jesus gathered with the disciples to celebrate Passover, when he instituted the great sacrament that we have come to practice in the church, the sacrament of the table, which we will take part in just a few minutes. That evening was spent in agony, as you know. Jesus going into the garden, falling on his knees and crying to God, asking God, if it is your will, let this cup pass from me, but not according to what I desire, but may your will be done. When he yielded his life to God and what was coming. The agony of that day and the suffering of the following day, the second day when he was crucified and hung on the cross, is now all but history. It is over. Now is the third day and we gather as we have in all the years that we have been coming together to do one thing and that is to give our witness, to add to the record of the scriptures that Christ the Lord is risen indeed today. Across the globe, in every language, in every nation, every believing church gathers to give the same acclamation that Jesus is now alive. What a glorious message that we have to proclaim. What a great witness that we have as a church to declare. But I guarantee you that no one in the history of humankind has ever made the claim that he died and has risen again. Only in the Lord Jesus Christ we find this great declaration. This morning I want to invite you to journey with me, to join me in, in my quest to meet this risen Lord one more time. And the first place that we will go to is the garden, the garden tomb. Many of us who have had the privilege to be there, we know what a sight that is. To be in the garden where he was laid. The empty tomb is there to proclaim the words, he is not here, he is risen. We are told by the Gospel writer John that on that day, the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and other women come to the tomb. They come with the single purpose of anointing the body of Christ that they could not do on that Friday because of the Sabbath that was fast approaching. So they come early in the morning to anoint with spices. But alas, when Mary comes near to the tomb, what does she discover? She discovers that the tomb the, the stone that guarded the tomb was now removed. She is perplexed, she is disturbed. She is standing there weeping, wondering what happened. Where have they taken him? Why have they done this? Was it not enough that they did what they did on Friday? What an inglorious thing to do to the body of a deceased. That they robbed her and the others of the joy of anointing the body of Christ. John records very clearly how heartbroken she was as she stood there by that gravesite. When she does go back to the disciples and she tells them, somebody has taken the body of our Lord. They have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have made him. You know the story, Peter and John make it to the tomb and when they come there, they also discover the same thing. And then they go back. When Mary doesn't go back, she is still there. Some of us are like that, aren't we? 
Some of us are not like Peter, not like John, not like the disciples locked behind doors, but we want to be there. We want to make sure that we will see the end of this. We will not give up. We are passionate. So she stays there outside the tomb weeping. Well, she already had met the angels. We know the story. The two angels that were inside, they proclaimed to her that, you know, he's not here. Why are you weeping? Why are you crying? She says, they've taken the Lord. I do not know where they have laid him. As soon as she says that, she turns around and she sees this figure. The figure of a man and she assumes that this is the gardener. She is not able to recognize him. This is one thing that we need to keep in mind as we look at some of these uh, accounts, that at times people were not able to place him. People were not able to recognize him. Mary, of all the people you will want to believe that will be the one to identify Jesus when she saw him, but she was not. Perhaps there were tears in her eyes and it was not clear. Perhaps it was still dark outside and, and it was not very clear. Maybe she just saw, saw the shadow. But I think there was a reason why she was kept from seeing him until Jesus comes close to her. And she asks him the question, Sir, if you have taken him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Perhaps Jesus wanted to make that opportunity for her to express her prayer, her love for the Lord. Perhaps there are some of us who need to make that kind of a prayer in our own lives. Maybe we need to come clean with our own confession and maybe we need to come to the empty tomb of our lives and ask God to reveal to us what we need to hear, to see. There is only one word that she hears. And that word from this man standing in front of her is nothing but her name, Mary. And the scripture says, as soon as she heard the name, as soon as she heard this man whom she did not recognize address her, Mary, immediately, she is the gospel writer, she knew that this was Jesus. Perhaps some of us need that personal and intense relationship. We do not want to hear somebody else tell us about God. We do not want somebody else to tell us the story about Jesus. We want a direct connection. We want to hear our name being called out just as God called out the name of Samuel. Have you, my dear beloved, have you heard your name being called by Almighty God? Are you here this morning because you know for sure that your name has been lifted up. Your name has been called by God. And therefore you know in your heart without any shadow of doubt that Jesus is truly alive. Rabboni is her response, which means teacher. Well, Jesus gives her consolation, gives her comfort, and gives her a mission. Same thing for us, no matter what our condition, no matter what our trial, no matter what our pain, no matter what our suffering may have been, when we come to the empty tomb and we meet the risen Lord, call out our name. He is there to give us the comfort that we need. He is there to embrace us. He is there to give us the assurance that he will not leave nor forsake us and that he has a mission for us. The second event that I would like to take us with on this journey is a road, a road called the road to Emmaus, just a seven mile journey from Jerusalem and we know the story again, it is that same evening, the day of the resurrection, two of the disciples, Cleopas and his friend, they are walking back home, they had been to Jerusalem for the Passover and they had witnessed the, the, the whole event, events of that week, the arrest of Jesus, the trial, the crucifixion, and yes, they were there when they buried him. And even when the women came back and Mary came back and pronounced that Jesus is now alive, I have seen the Lord, they did not believe it. Is it possible? 
Is it possible that some of us have been coming to these services time and time again, year after year after year, we have heard these messages, and yet our lives are not touched, yet we are not convinced, yet we are still in our own depression, we are still lost in our own darkness, and we are walking the road to Emmaus, and whatever that road may be for you, you are walking sand. Scripture tells us very clearly in Luke chapter 24, verse 13, they were walking back towards their hometown of Emmaus and they were deeply in sorrow as they were talking about what had just happened. Word tells us that Jesus himself came and drew near to them and he joined them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Once again, just as Mary was sort of kept from recognizing Jesus, even the two disciples who journeyed with him, walked with him for several hours, were kept from recognizing him. Jesus asked them a question, what are you discussing with each other while you are walking along? And they looked sad. They stood still looking sad. Isn't that such a sad depiction of believers, of disciples? Even after Jesus was risen, even after Mary proclaimed, I have seen the Lord, he's alive, they were still sad. Why? Because it hadn't become personal for them. My friend, you and I have been part of the Christian church for a long time. You and I have been coming to Good Friday services. We've been coming to Easter services. We've been coming to church services. But has it taken over our lives? Has it overcome the depression and the sadness of our lives? The two disciples were still very sad on the very day of resurrection. Isn't that a telling story of the condition of the church at times? But Jesus doesn't give up on them. He walks with them, opening the scriptures from Moses and all the prophets. He begins to expound on the, on the need for the resurrection of the Lord. And they invite him at the end of the journey to come and sit at table with them. And he walks in, he sits down at a table such as this. And they give him the honor to do the prayer. And as he is taking the bread, and as he is blessing the bread, and as he is breaking the bread, and as he is distributing the bread among themselves, their eyes were opened. And they were able to see that this is none other than their Lord. Perhaps some of us need to come to that table. We've been going to Bible studies, we've been going to prayer meetings, we've been going to church services, we've been hearing testimonies from other people, and yet our lives are not changed. Maybe, maybe we should come and sit down with him at the table, and maybe we should allow him to take the bread and break it. Maybe that is what you and I need to be broken. We need to be taken, we need to be blessed, we need to be broken, and we need to be given for others. In the breaking of the bread and in the sharing of the fellowship, their eyes were opened. They immediately get up and get back to Jerusalem. They travel back to proclaim, the Lord is risen indeed. Finally, the the final event that I would like us to bring to is the upper room again. Now this is the second time that Jesus comes to visit them. The first time was on the day of resurrection. Now this was a week afterwards. Thomas, who was not present at the first visit, is now there. We all know the story of Thomas. We are very fond of Thomas because he, according to tradition, came to India in the very first century proclaiming the gospel to our people. We are so thankful for Thomas who said on that occasion, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger in his nail prints and I put my hand in his side, I will not believe. Some folks need more than their name being called. Some folks need more than being recognized in the breaking of the bread and in the fellowship of the table. Some need evidence beyond any doubt. They want to put their finger in the nail prints of Jesus. They want to put their hand in the side. 
and the graciousness of our Lord. He could have been angry with Thomas. He could have said some nasty things. He doesn't do that. He invites him, Thomas, come. Come and touch me. Come and put your fingers in my nail prints. Come, take your hand, put it in my side and feel where the spear made a hole in my side. Perhaps there are some of us here, we are still not convinced or we still need proof or evidence beyond any doubt. And this morning God offers you that proof and that is the body of Christ. Thomas touched the body of Christ. <coughs> You and I are given that privilege every single time we come together. This is the body of Christ. You are the body of Christ. When you see one another, when you shake hands with one another, when you give a hug to one another, when you have a conversation with one another, what are we doing? We are touching the nail prints of our Lord. Throughout the centuries, the church has been in existence for what reason? For one reason only, and that is to give witness to the power of the resurrection. You know that story when a disciple had to be had to be picked in the place of Judas Iscariot. What was the qualification? The one qualification was that this person to be chosen to become an apostle in their midst had to be one who was with the Lord all the days of the ministry of the Lord and a witness to the resurrection. My dear friends, you and I, you and I are the body of Christ. You and I are to be that living proof of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let the world see you. Let the world put their finger in your life. Let the world put their hand on your body and recognize that you are a living proof that Jesus Christ is alive. But alas, when the world looks at the church, what do they see? Do they see the power of the risen Lord in you and in me? Or do they see something else? Do they see something else? This morning my challenge to you and to me is that we come in a powerful way to come to the garden tomb, to hear your name being called of God. My prayer to you is that as you come to the table that you will recognize the presence of him who died and those for you by prayer is that you and I will become the body of Christ that others will come and touch and feel and know that Christ is indeed risen when they see you. Amen. Let us bow in a word of prayer.